Um, yeah, I'm very, very happy um, that uh, we have this topic here and that Dominic is uh, my interview partner here um, because I think it's uh, it's um, uh, quite interesting. The media industry is quite an interesting industry because it has gone already through a lot of disruption and it's, uh, it's in that sense um, somewhat, let's say, ahead of the curve of uh, quite some other industries. And I uh, think we're going to uh, dig deep into uh, what what the future will bring and how that process has gone so far. But we've, be, be, before we start, what I would love to see is quickly who is from the media industry here. Just oh, what 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 other industries do we have? Like retail. Who's from retail? Also, close. What other industries? We have like fintech, finance, banking, someone, insurance, someone? We don't work. What? You don't work, you're all un un unemployed then. <laughs> Somebody working for the government, I don't know. Agencies. So you just work for everyone. Yeah. You don't care. Okay, okay. Okay, great. Um, Maybe one, uh, then one other question, who is working for a company that is, let's say, a digital immigrant? And uh, let's raise the hand, who is for a company that has not uh, been, um, let, let's say, started in the digital, like, uh, yeah, not natively, web, web native? And uh, who's working for, for a company that is completely web native? Okay, so uh, very digital. Okay, Dominique, who are you? What do you do? Good afternoon. I'm uh, Dominique William, and I'm uh, Chief Digital Officer for Arte. I'm located in Strasbourg. We have offices in Baden-Baden and Paris. And uh, before joining Arte, I was a producer in New Media in uh, Canada, actually, in Montreal. Um, I also, before that, worked for Arte, uh, and we launched a platform that's called Arte Concert, which is a digital offering for online music with over, I would say, a thousand uh, live performances per year. So I've been working in... Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, one fan. <laughs> you, you get free credits from me afterwards. <laughs> Um, so I've worked in digital pretty much all my life, but all the time in companies which were not digital first, meaning companies that have migrated from a traditional business to a digital business. And in media, it's particularly interesting because the landscape has changed a lot in the last couple of years. Our competition has changed. Everything has pretty much changed. The, the, the work that we do has changed. So um, I'm here to talk about that today. Let's, let's quickly dive into, uh, into art a little bit. Can you specify a little bit what is your role uh, there and what kind of uh, challenges is art facing? Uh, and many of these know the challenges, but maybe a little bit um, give it some uh, juice from your perspective. Yeah, so my, my position is a fairly new position because uh, this uh, chief digital officer position was opened a year ago, actually. So it's fairly new. And I think the fact that it's new is emblematic that we, we are shifting from being a traditional broadcaster with a website to being a media which online presence is as important as the uh, broadcast presence, I would say. Um, challenges facing artists are numerous, but the main one being that uh, for many years we lived as a broadcast channel, meaning the competition was very uh, tightly constrained, a couple of channels were on air, and we knew our competition very well. Um, in the last couple of years, the competition has come from everywhere, and from uh, players we didn't really expect at, the, at that point. Um, if I put myself in the perspective of a cultural media, uh, our main competition actually is not another TV channel, it's YouTube. I mean, if you're looking for information about any artist, about any opera, screenplay, whatever. I mean, I, I'm sorry to say that for myself, and I, I confess, I mean, the best source of information is very likely YouTube at that point. And it's a very different competition than what we used to. So we have to readjust uh, the way we work, but we have also to always keep in mind what's our goal and what's the service that we bring to people, and how do we address this service properly. So it's 
a major shift for a broadcaster whose main job was to put content on air. And now we are in a position where we have to offer a service and reach people wherever they are and the places are changing dramatically. So I guess that's the main challenge for us right now. And uh, I, I heard very little broadcast and very much your, uh, like, <laughs> so it sounds very, let's put it that way, very forward thinking. But nevertheless, um, uh, I, uh, you, you still, you are a broadcaster right now, right? So you are in this kind of uh, dual um, situation. Um, when is broadcasting the classical way, uh, when will it be insignificant or when will it be dead in a, like, a, a relevant way? Uh, of course, I guess that's the main question that um, that, that we are uh, addressing today. And uh, the better off, uh, every couple of years we hear we have only like two years to survive as a broadcaster, and that always get back that get gets push, pushed back two years in in advance every two years, so it never ends. Um, I guess the, the the question I would take the question backwards is. What do people use and what experience do they, do they want at, at which point in time? Uh, one thing is very clear, younger generation don't use TV as other generation do, but most, the more people age, the more they come back to traditional TV. And what we see is not the TV usage uh, diminishing, it's marginally people using that TV for other things. But mostly broadcast so far is surviving. How long that's going to last, I have no idea, but my bet is really that people are going to keep watching TV. They're just going to stop watching linear TV as we know it today. And uh, personally, I work in the TV industry and in, uh, for a broadcaster, and I never watch broadcast TV. I never do that anymore. I keep on going on uh, Netflix for one side and on or on app, on Apple TV, on Android TV, on whatever because I just can't stick to a schedule. Nevertheless, I still consume media content and I still watch it in front of my TV. So, um, my feeling You're is... not watching your own channel? Sorry, just maybe we have to... It's, it's the only one I'm watching, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, actually, I, I think the, the, the point of TV, and the, the, that's why the question of death of TV is not, maybe not that relevant, is that watching TV is actually a communal activity, which is different from watching content on your smartphone where you're basically alone. So when you're watching TV with your uh, wife, husband, kids, dog, whatever, you're basically watching the something with, with people. And that's what makes also that people still go to the movies because you're in a specific setting. So TV is probably not going to be dead, but as broadcaster, if we stick to linear TV as we know it today, we're probably going to be dead in a few years. How many I can, I don't know, we all can take bets, I have no idea at that point. Maybe I want to take a very quick break to ask the audience, uh, how many of you have, have watched linear TV um, in the last week? Okay. Um, how many of you have, have watched um, YouTube in the last week? Okay. Yeah, that was... Uh, you made my point. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then um, uh, you, you, you said that YouTube is essentially a competitor, but it's actually also very useful to you, right? As a, um, as a platform. How, how do you use uh, YouTube and uh, why? It, it is actually, uh, it's a competitor of, of some sort, but it's also a very powerful tool for us to, to use. So we have always to keep the balance between where are we? What do we use different channels of uh, distribution for? And what do we gain for it? At the end of the day, our job as Arte, because we are a public broadcaster, is to provide content that people actually watch and that people are happy of watching. So um, I think one of our early refocus was uh, the so-called hyper -distri distribution of our content, meaning we wanted to make sure that no matter what you use, no matter what your viewing habits are, we provide you the right content at the right place. We don't want to force people to come to our TV channel or to our, to our website, that's not our role, but it's our role to make sure that 
if you're in interested in, I don't know what, uh, Stanley Kubrick's films or uh, the operas by uh, Mozart, that you can find them also on YouTube, maybe also on Facebook, maybe also on or on app and so on and so forth. So it's really a matter of um, not only producing content but also making sure that, that you can watch the content no matter what your viewing habits are. It, it sounds a little bit similar to the discussion um, that, that I, I see in the, in the retail space, always the question, should I sell on Amazon or not? And um, aren't you essentially, when you put your content on YouTube, aren't you feeding the beast, let's say? And at some point you might just be filtered out and uh, just like Facebook, uh, a lot of people have uh, built up uh, big audiences. All of a sudden algorithms change and the audio audience is much less valuable because people just don't see the content anymore. Absolutely. Uh, I think Facebook and YouTube are two very different examples. I mean, uh, for us, we call YouTube a media platform when we call Facebook a social platform. Um, we have always been as out there careful about Facebook because privacy concerns is one point and I think it's a political standpoint also from us to invest not that much in Facebook but also because uh, if you put everything on Facebook and a lot of people have been through that in the industry this last year you have a major risk of suddenly Facebook changing its rules, algorithms, and so on. And we don't want to be in a position where we have to pay for people to watch our content. That would be unfair to the users, that would be unfair to uh, the industry, that would be unfair to everyone. So we've been very careful for fa on Facebook, and typically the changes that have occurred on Facebook in 2019 have had little impact on us. Uh, on YouTube side, on the other way, it's we, we treat it as a different reality for us. YouTube is mostly a search engine for our alpha content where a lot of people go. It's the world's second largest search engine, so we have to be there and we have to provide a service there. Uh, so it's two different realities, but um, again, I don't recall any uh, board meeting where we don't have discussions about the political implications of uh, these kind of third party platforms. And we, and by the way, we, we really wished there was a European equivalent to that. So, what are the platforms that you're on? You have your own, your own site and your own app. Yep. Um, uh, you have YouTube, where you put how much content, all of it, or? Uh, part of it, not everything. Dep dep depending on the rights, we tend to be maximalist on YouTube, meaning we put everything we can, but we cannot put everything because of uh, restrictions. Okay, and Facebook, you basically don't don't use. Uh, we create content to entice users to come to our other uh, platforms. I would say it's mostly an advertising uh, platform for us. Okay, so what is what is in five years? What is what is the end game? There is no end game, but what is the uh, what will the landscape look like? Because well, uh, I would say in addition to the list to the list you, you you've given, um, we are on a lot other places. We are on Fire TV, we are on Apple TV, we are on uh, LG, Samsung, whatever. We are on pretty much every uh, place, or we try to be on every place you can watch a TV program actually. Um, last time I counted, we had. Uh, but sorry, that is that is linear TV again, right? No, no, no. This is, this is non-linear TV. This, oh, okay, okay. And uh, also, I'm, I might add that um, the rethinking of our job goes beyond putting linear TV in a non-linear mode. Uh, I mentioned it with Arte Concert, uh, but also in different fields, we have way more content than what is shown on broadcast. Meaning, uh, if you go to the uh, if you go to the Arte uh, website today or on the Arte app or whatever, you have access to approximately 8,000 different programs. Only a part of them are ever going to be broadcast. We offer way more online than what we offer uh, on linear TV, which means it has been a shift for us as well to consider ourselves as a, a media from which broadcast is one output way 
but really we are a media group that broadcasts and I use the term broadcast in, uh, in, the, in the wrong sense here, but that broadcast not only on air, but also on the internet. And that's, that's a shift for a TV channel. Uh, then again, the uh, question, what is in uh, five years? What is, oh, uh, that was a question. What is the picture? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I wish I knew. Uh, uh, I guess the question is not that much being uh, what is in five years, but how do we manage uh, the progress that we are trying to make in the digital world. Um, I'm always taking this example when I illustrate that um, for the time it took to switch from uh, four third uh, picture to 16 by nine, it was for broadcaster it took approximately 10 years because you had to rethink everything, you had to get programs in a new format and stuff. Uh, in the digital world, we are really rethinking our strategy on a uh, not quality basis, but like pretty much every six months. And we undo a lot of stuff that we do because the market goes so fast. And the uh, culture change that we had to uh, implement in our company was to make people understand that we were in a permanent beta version and that we would take turns in our strategy and it doesn't matter, it's not a problem, we have to try things and we have to fail to take the right path. So since we take new curves every six months, it's very difficult to predict where we're going to be in, in five years. Uh, my guess, my wild guess is that uh, the broadcasting example, meaning the, the, the linear broadcasting is going to be probably like the premium offering of Arte, but that you're going to have like a lot of different ways to watch Arte with thematic channels, with a completely um, non-linear way of consuming content. And my guess is that TV sets are going to be in the home, but TV sets are not going to be the TV set that we know today. There is going to be a, like a fusion between uh, the PC uh, as we know it to the end, the TV set that people are just going to use TV sets as interactive screens and we have to adapt to that reality. And in, in, that, in that extent, um, Netflix, Google, uh, Netflix, YouTube and so on are probably the main competitors in the future for Arte and not other TV channels. So, I, I, I would love to touch on, uh, on your first point a little bit, uh, a little bit later um, uh, regarding the transformation, etc. Um, uh, the second one would be interesting for me to understand uh, what are you actually optimizing for if you if if you think uh, if you say okay Netflix is going to be one of the biggest competitors um, are you optimizing for attention are you because you're very quality driven right you don't want to you're probably you're not that mainstream I would well I don't know. depends what you define by mainstream yeah. but okay. okay yeah Fair um, uh, so. Uh, also, what are your success criteria? Uh, when you put things on YouTube or Fire TV or or whatever, how do you measure success there, and um, how is that changing? But right now, we have two main KPIs, which are video views and average watch time. Meaning, how what is the percentage of a program that someone someone watches, basically. Um, but again, just as a strategy, we reassess our KPIs like every six months to be sure that. Uh, our KPIs reflect the direction in which we, we, we push our strategy. Um, we are in the moment optimizing for, uh, to make sure that our content and the quality of our content, which we don't want to change, reaches the maximum of people. And um, also to get a bit away from the um, not so mainstream idea that people are from Arte, meaning that we, sh we would be an elitist channel only uh, showing movies in black and white uh, from uh, whatever Eastern country and uh, for only classical operas. We want to switch from that to being a cultural channel that's accessible for everyone. And I think we have the right content in the moment to do that, but we don't have the right image. So that's, that's a difficulty. But just to give you an example, uh, of course, we do operas, we do, uh, uh, we do, I would say, classical programming, but we also do the, the Hellfest, we do uh, the summer festivals ranging from heavy metal to uh, 
indie music and so on, meaning we really have content, cultural content for every taste. Um, just to give you an idea, the, the, every, every year we do the Hellfest and we have approximately one million person that connect during the couple of days of the Hellfest to watch heavy metal programming on Arte, which I'm sure you didn't suspect existed at this point. Um, our challenge now is to make the people who come to watch the Hellfest on Arte understand that there is more than the Hellfest and that the next program is not going to be uh, Richard Wagner, but something that they can relate to as well. Uh, everybody knows the, oh, I don't know if everybody knows, I know, uh, the, the magazine Tracks that we have on Arte. That's one of our well-known magazines. Uh, and this was only one slot in the, pro in the broadcast programming, but really, like tracks, we have a lot of stuff on the art uh, on, on the art offering. We do a lot of things with street art, we do urban culture and so on and so forth. But getting this content nach uh, vorne in Deutsch um, is really our challenge at that point. I speak a bit of Deutsch. I have a lot of uh, follow-up questions on that, but I also want to open up very soon uh, the, um, <coughs> the questions uh, from the audience. So uh, if you have questions, already think about them, and uh, we're going to open it up very, very soon. I quickly want to touch about um, uh, on a more like company internal topic, digital transformation, a very bad word or, or overused word, um, uh, but certainly as a, like I would say, classical broadcaster, going uh, through or following this uh, strategy, this uh, vision. Um, uh, um, you must be going through some kind of transformation. Can you just very quickly um, uh, tell us about challenges, lessons learned, something like that? Well, uh, the challenges are, uh, for me are the following. Um, I would say that in board meetings we spend 50% of the time discussing digital and then it's 10% of the resources and 1% of people's uh, mental time, basically, because everybody is focused on the core of the business, which is broadcasting, and you need to broadcast 24 hours a day, and everything has to be like very tight, and, and so on and so forth. So the change, and the, the difficulty of change is really like bringing everybody forward on the major importance that is the digital world and uh, I think we are moving forward but it goes always slower than you would expect because uh, everybody's in their uh, daily jobs and you still have to get the broadcast running and uh, you have habits that are formed. I'm just going to give you an example on that. Um, I was at the uh, Berlinale in, uh, in Berlin a couple of uh, months ago and uh, for the first time I really felt uh, how intense the pressure was from Netflix to go and talk to producers that were usually coming to us. And typically uh, when we talk to producers they said, well, you know, I'll tell you very nice people and so on, uh, but every time I submit a project to you it takes a lot of time to be instructed, to be uh, approved and so on and so forth. And I go to Netflix and in 24 hours they write me a check and I can move forward with my project. Um, again, the, the time that we are taking to instruct project is not only uh, for fun, it's also because it serves a purpose. It means that we take time to develop the project, to go at the end of the idea, to make sure that we have great programming and great content at the end of the day. But really, the all, all structure has to adapt to this new competition, otherwise all good producers are going to go to Netflix and we are going to end up with the not so good ones, uh, which we want to avoid, of course. So um, I think it's really about, uh, as I mentioned, uh, making people understand that the, the, the online strategy is not fixed and that is going to be uh, we're going to take a lot of curves and a lot of uh, seemingly bizarre decisions, uh, but again, they're necessary because uh, we learn as we walk and the landscape is also changing crazily fast. I mean, if you've seen the, the production budget of uh, Netflix, it has, it is scale of magnitudes higher than 
our global budget is. Uh, in 2018, I think they invested about 15 billion dollars in original production. But the global uh, RT budget for the whole year is 400 million euros. So that gives you an idea of the scale of magnitude to, for, for what we're competing against. So I think it's uh, always uh, also we, we have to be fair in assessing what our strengths and weaknesses are and what our position in the market is. And that, that's very difficult to do when you're a channel that's 25 years, 25 years old and has a certain image and so on. So it's always being like uh, doubting a lot about who we are and what we do. Uh, that keeps us, keeps us moving forward, I guess. Thanks. So, I really want to open up to questions now. Who has questions? <coughs> Just speak loud for, for a second. Okay, I tried to speak now. I hear you. My name is Thomas Steinberg, I'm from uh, Top Citizen. Uh, do you think the, the development of the legal environment in Europe is uh, transporting your, uh, your efforts to become a kind of high quality media distributor on the internet side? Or is it more challenging? That's a good question. That's a very global question about the, the regulatory framework for medias in, in Europe. Um, I would say so far uh, there has been, um, I'll try to answer that quickly, um, mostly the pure internet players have escaped the regulation of uh, the uh, global uh, media industry, meaning that they don't pay the same taxes, they don't have to invest in certain type of creations and so on and so, on and so forth. Uh, as a TV channel, we have to participate in the global industry, which is only fair, meaning we have to pay taxes to producers to, so that new movies get made. And um, so far, the pure internet player have a bit escaped that. We have also requirements and that we more than follow to broadcast mainly European content to uh, European audiences and so on. Um, so it puts us uh, a bit in a, in a weird position. Um, for us at Arte, it hasn't been a challenge because we were already like that. So we were, it, it's also one of our main goal to promote European culture. But I imagine for other TV channels, it's much more difficult and they have to compete uh, against people who don't follow the same rules than they do. Um, so for us, I would say it doesn't have a big impact. For other ones, I guess it had. Who else? Uh, you mentioned that you create content for everybody, just not everybody knows about it. Have you, are there some changes in the preferences for content that you've noticed over the last years? What kind of content people want to see? And is it sometimes hard adapting to that, but also staying true to yourself? That's a great question. Um, we, a couple of years ago, there was an obsession by everyone saying that people want short content. Uh, that the attention span on Facebook was 20 something seconds. And uh, we are a TV channel that usually makes content that's 26 minutes long and plus. Uh, so for us, it was a major challenge. We tried to venture into very short content and quite frankly, we lost ourselves quite clearly. Uh, what we think now and to my great pleasure is that um, the viewing, the average viewing time is really increasing dramatically, uh, especially on YouTube, which is getting close to what we have now on our own platforms. So what we feel is that uh, user more and more tend to watch long form content and tend to dive in content. I guess the, the, the time of very short form is uh, behind us, um, which I think is good for everyone. Um, 
Now that being said, uh, yes, we had the opportunity with digital because we have much more space to put content to go into things that were not allowed, not, not allowed, but not who had couldn't find their place on broadcast. And I mentioned, uh, for example, uh, heavy metal festivals. Um, now we broadcast them very occasionally once a year, but uh, you, you won't find a regular programming of heavy metal on, the, uh, on air, but you can find it on our website, which is, I think, personally great, even though I, I don't listen to heavy metal, but uh, I, I think it's cool that we can uh, really outreach new publics with that type of content. So um, I would say the, the major switch is really from short form to long form, but not in the type of content that we produce. Yeah. Another question in the I back. Think, uh, I think uh, time is pretty ah. much done. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. That was done. The clock, the clock is ringing. Sorry, Bob. We have to obey the clock. <laughs> yeah. The clock is, uh, is the boss. Um, so thank you very, very much, uh, Dominic. I, um, I think you will be... Thank you. Um, uh, Dominic, uh, you will probably be available around here so people can still ask you questions. Um, yes, actually, for a couple of minutes because I have to catch a train after that, but uh, for a couple of minutes. Okay, later. Let's, let's say um, out in the front, he'll be available yep. for uh, questions uh, once more. Thank you very, very much for thank taking you. the time and speaking so openly. Thanks, thank you. Dominic.